So Amar will uh, talk about diagrammatic sets and the smash product of monodial theories. You can I mean, let us start the video. I will give an overview of two papers. The first is called Diagrammatic Sets and Rewriting Weak High Categories. The second is called the Smash Product of Monodial Theories. We can find both in the archive. The 94 and 74 pages, respectively, they are quite long, so I won't go into much detail. Combinatorial models of spaces, aka homotopy types, or directed spaces such as higher categories, are often based on the idea of a shape category. The objects of a shape category are the shapes that the cells of the space may have, and the morphisms are ways in which a shape can map to another shape. A space is then a pre shape on the shape category, satisfying some properties. Examples of shapes include globes, Synthesis, cubes, and optopes, giving rise to globular, simply cubical, and operatic sets. In 1991, Mikhail Kapranov and Vladimir Bayavatsky, from now on KV, considered a very rich shape category containing globes, synthesis, cubes, and many other shapes. Free shifts in this category were called diagrammatic sets. KV's goal was to prove the homotopy hypothesis for a model of high group points based on strict high categories. Let's call these strict high groupoids. For a given definition of high groupoids, the homotopy hypothesis states roughly that all classical homotopy types are faithfully modeled by high groupoids in such a way that the tower of n truncations of the high groupoid in which we identify homotopical n cells models the Postnikov tower of a homotopy type. KV's strategy was to prove that strict high groupoids are equivalent to certain 500 diagrammatic sets and then prove the homotopy hypothesis for 500 diagrammatic sets. In 1998, Carlos Simpson showed that the overall claim in KV was unfixably wrong. Those details in KV were scarce, but has remained unclear where exactly the proof went wrong. One outcome of my work is that it salvages in part this half of the proof, so long as you switch to an improved version of diagrammatic sets. And at last, it pinpoints a critical mistake in this half. You may ask, why bother? You already have nice models based on synthesis and cubes. Well, there are some emerging use cases for high categories coming from computer science or applied category theory with a somewhat different flavor. For one, they focus on specific presentations of high categories by generators and relations. You could say they focus on spaces with the structure of a cell complex. In this context, it is essential to have a rich enough shape category because different presentations with different cell shapes will have different computational properties. They also focus on explicit diagrammatic reasoning, or diagram rewriting. In a string diagram picture, it goes like this. You have a generating rewrite, you match its source to a sub-diagram for a given diagram, and you replace it with its target. In the cell complex picture, this is a kind of cell surgery. You match the source of an n plus 1 cell to an n cell, and glue it onto it. This defines a homotopy, modeling the rewrite of one cell into another. So there is this strong analogy between rewriting and homotopy, and we like to have a formalism for rewriting that is both expressive and sound for homotopical algebra. Some formalisms for diagram rewriting focus on special cases, like rewriting in symmetric monoidal categories. For the general problem of rewriting in high categories, we have two formalisms, polygraphs, based on strict high categories, and the associative model of n categories, used by the homotopy I.O. proof assistant. Due to Simpson's result, Polygraphs are not sound for homotopical algebra, and for associative and categories, as far as I know, it is still an open question. Returning to the broken half of KV's proof, these two sides are not equivalent. The idea is that polygraphs live in the same world as these, but they really want to be living in the same world as these. So, in a nutshell, the idea was to redevelop diagrammatic sets as an equally expressive but homotopically sound alternative to polygraphs. Now, KV's shape category was based on Michael Johnson's composable pasting schemes. Simon Henri has observed that with this choice, shapes are not closed under a number of natural operations, which leads to unnecessary complications. I replaced Johnson's pasting schemes with Richard Steiner's directed complexes, a more flexible formulas. In both of these, the idea is to encode a cell shape by its oriented face poset. In a face poset, we only remember if a cell is in the boundary of another cell. In an oriented face poset, we also mark cells in co-dimension 1 as belonging to either the source or the target boundary of the cells that cover them. Steiner 
They find combinatorial conditions ensuring that an oriented poset is the oriented face poset of a composable and categorical diagram. He called these oriented posets molecules. A molecule with the greatest element is an atom. I focused on a particularly well-behaved class of atoms, the regular ones. They have the property that, if you forget orientation, they are face posets of regular CW balls. So, regular atoms are the objects of my shape category that I denote with this hydrogen atom symbol. The morphisms are maps that are compatible with source and target boundaries, and the diagrammatic set is a pre-sheaf on the atom category. The atom category contains many others as full subcategories. The reflexive globe category, simplex category, category of cubes with connections, and the category of positive optodes with contractions. Importantly, maps of atoms are order preserving, so we get a forgetful functor to the category of both sets. You can compose these with a simplicial nerve functor, then do a left Kahn extension. This gives us one adjunction between diagrammatic sets and simplicial sets. Restriction to the simplest category together with its left adjoint gives another adjunction. The composite of these two adjunctions, up to natural isomorphism, is the barycentric subdivision X functor adjunction on simplicial sets. I use this triangle of adjunctions together with some very explicit combinatorics to connect the diagrammatic and simplicial homotopy theory and prove a version of the homotopy hypothesis for diagrammatic sets. I also define a model of higher categories in the co-inductive infinity-infinity sense based on diagrammatic sets. This is similar to the completial or opitopic models, in that weak composites are exhibited by higher dimensional equivalence cells. Unlike these models, though, it has the advantage that the equivalence cells are defined by pseudo-invertibility, as in this paper by Eugenia Chen. This is an algebraic notion, and that simplifies many things. For example, it makes it easy to define the localization of a higher category at a set of cells. Now, another nice thing about atoms is that they are closed under many operations which we can extend to diagrammatic sets. Like lobes, they are closed under suspension. Like simplices, they are closed under join. Like cubes, they are closed under gray products. The gray product is a kind of oriented, non-symmetric version of a Cartesian product. And in the same way as we define the smash product of pointed spaces using the Cartesian product, we can define a smash product of pointed diagrammatic sets using the gray product. In my second paper, I show that this gray smash product has a surprising connection with the construction of props in categorical universal algebra. The colored prop is one of the gadgets we use to describe generalized algebraic theories. It generalizes both lower wave theories and symmetric operands. And there is a tensor product operation of props that generalizes both the tensor product of low wave theories and a boardman Vogt product of symmetric operands. Now, there are planar and braided non symmetric versions of props. They are called pros and props, respectively. The tensor product does not restrict to either, but there is a kind of external product of pros producing a prop. It is compatible with the tensor product of props in the sense that the tensor product of two props that are free on pros is the free prop on their external product. Now, if you are familiar with the periodic table of n categories, a pro as a singly monoidal theory corresponds to a bicategory with one zero cell, but a prop as a doubly monoidal theory corresponds to a tricategory with a single zero cell. Using this idea, we can define embeddings of pros and props into pointed diagrammatic sets. What I proved is that the external product of pros arises as a low-dimensional truncation of the smash product of their embeddings. More in general, the idea is that the smash product of an n monoidal theory with a k monoidal theory produces an n plus k monoidal theory. This eventually stabilizes to symmetric monoidal, and we could in principle recover the tensor product of props directly. But that would require identifying props with an explicit model of seven-dimensional categories, and it's not something I want to do. To me, the most interesting thing is that because all sets in the diagrammatic sets are oriented, we can take the smash product not just of theories, but of presentations of theories with oriented equations. And that produces another presentation with oriented equations. Furthermore, it produces some higher dimensional data, which gets destroyed if we truncate the presented theory. If you're into homotopical algebra, this data is what you would call oriented syzygies. If you're into rewriting, it is data that exhibits the confluence of some new critical branchings in the presentation. So the smash product produces additional data compared to the tensor product, which is both homotopically and computationally interesting. And it seems plausible to me that if 
we start from nice coherent presentations of two theories, we may systematically obtain nice coherent presentations of the tensor product. And that is something that I want to explore. That's all that I'll say today. Thank you for listening. And if you're interested, please check out the papers. So please uh, go go ahead. Uh -huh. Yeah, so I would like to just uh, thank very, like, <laughs> very deeply grateful to the organizers for managing to organize this edition of CT, uh, in part because um, it's been, I think, five or six years that I've been wanting to come to CT, and every year there was something which prevented me from doing that. And of course, we all know what prevented us all last year. Um, so, well, I'm, I'm especially grateful for you know, breaking this spell and uh, managing to organize this edition um, against all circumstances and <laughs> allowing me to present here. Um, and for the same reason, and then in this, in this video, as you see, I, I like instead of, uh, Kind of focusing on um, on the very latest thing I've been doing, I've tried to give a kind of general overview of different things that I've been doing in the past few years. Uh, so I I'm aware that there are, there is not much detail in the video. It's more of a broad picture one, but uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions and talk about any aspects of it more in detail. So please, uh, any question from this room or the other room or the Zoom? Yes. Now I'll take the other way because. Uh, thanks for the talk. I really enjoyed the presentation. Um, I have a question. I think I missed um how you get uh the conductive definition of infinity infinity categories with your uh, in your framework and also uh were you referring to strict infinity infinity categories or weak uh, infinity infinity categories uh no so here i'm i'm, I'm referring to well i'm referring to weak infinity infinity categories and i'm referring to the uh to the co-inductive notion right where the, the one where kind of fully dualizable morphisms are are actually equivalences um so at the moment the fact that this definition is um is equivalent to all the other existing definitions of the same sort is just uh is just a conjecture in the sense that uh basically what i've done is just prove it uh in a quite weak sense for the infinity zero case um but uh, but because usually, like in the in the kind of semi-strict or strict models that uh, are not equivalent to the fully weak case, usually the problem is already at infinity zero level. It's not uh, so. That's that's why I am I'm quite confident that this does work as a definition. In terms of how how it is defined, um, again in this uh, um, in this category of diagrammatic sets. Um, well, the, the idea, of course, is that we would have different uh, different um, different classes of fibrant objects corresponding to. So, in, in, again, the the way that one one way of uh, defining an uh, an infinity uh, infinity category in this context is um, as an object which is fibrant with respect to some class of generating um, acyclical vibrations. And these would be exactly the ones that um, basically they tell me that uh, every every kind of composable diagram um, can be completed. Every composable n diagram can be completed to an n plus one diagram uh, whose uh, kind of other side is composed of a single cell, and the connecting cell is. Uh, an equivalence in this pseudo invertible sense. And uh, when I say that this pseudo invertibility is, is, is algebraic, uh, what, I, what I mean is that 
So there is a there is a kind of classifying object inside this category for these equivalences. Any other question? Any other question? I don't see on the Zoom if there is any. No. Okay, so let's thank Amal again for the lecture. <laughs>